It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the Coach. Today, we have a question from Kales Kales Kales, who says, As another religious person, how do you deal with the juxtaposition of the ideals of Christianity slash Mormonism, like compassion slash mercy, turning the other cheek and being a fighter? I feel like there should be a conflict here. Like, do we turn the other cheek as we respond with a low kick? Well... This is a complex but shockingly simple question. First of all, combat sports. It's a sport. It is not a personal affront. It is not a malicious, evil act. Now, if you believe it is, great. You don't have to do it. But let's break apart Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus tells people that famous, famous quote, which is taken out of context by almost everybody, misunderstood by almost everybody, to mean lie down like a submissive doormat and do nothing while people beat the snot out of you. No, that's not what he's telling you. Jesus is teaching you jujitsu. Jesus is teaching you judo. Let's get after it right here. So, Matthew 5. Jesus is telling the Jews in Jerusalem at this time, Look, this is what you've been taught. These are your cultural norms. And I'm going to tell you something different. I'm going to tell you something shockingly different than what you, were, what you were used to. He challenges the cultural norms. Ancient scripture is separated from us by multiple languages, multiple cultures, and in many cases, thousands of years of the passage of time. And so it's important to do a little bit of biblical exegesis once in a while. That's a fancy term for study the context, because context is for kings. On first reading, this scripture right here, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also sounds almost like, Lay down like a doormat and let people walk all over you. And I'm telling you, no, 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 not even remotely. In fact, quite the opposite. Let's back up a little bit. Actually, before we back up, let's skip to the very end of Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says this, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Everything that precedes this in Matthew 5 is a synopsis of how to be perfect like God is perfect. And we have to go back to the original Koine Greek, where a better translation of perfect is complete. Be complete like your Father in heaven is complete. Be a complete person. Be a complete man. So he's challenging the cultural norms, and what were some of those cultural norms? We have in verse 33, he points one of them out. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. What does that mean? It means in olden times, in the Hebrew culture, they would make declarations of oaths. They would swear on the heavens, swear by God, swear by their own throats, swear by their own lives, that they were telling the truth. And Jesus said, look, you don't need to do that. Just say yes and mean it, or no and mean it. You don't need to make all these fancy oaths. Just tell the truth and mean it. Be a man of your word. You don't need to forswear yourself and say, I swear to God I'm telling the truth. I swear on my mother's grave I'm telling the truth. You don't just tell the truth is what he's saying. He's challenging a cultural norm right here. And turn the other cheek is no different. What was going on in the Jewish culture at this time? Israel was occupied by the Romans. It had been conquered by the Roman Empire. And who was slapping the Jews on the cheek, on the right cheek specifically? The Romans and why the right cheek? Why the right cheek? You slap the right cheek with your left hand, if it is an open hand slap. And as, I, as I've mentioned before on this channel, an open hand slap is an insult. It is not 
a combative move, it is an insult. It is one of the most effeminate ways that a man could attack another man. It's a man trying to, trying to emasculate another man by hitting him with this effeminate movement. And why the left hand? Because, well, in the Roman culture, the left hand was the sinister hand. That's where the word sinister comes from, literally. It is the Roman, the Latin word, for left hand. Everybody who speaks Spanish understands this because it's sinestro, is left, sinister, right? Spanish comes from Latin. So, it's, we have these oppressive rulers, and the Jews are looking for a Messiah, a military type of Messiah to come and depose the Romans to get rid of these oppressive rulers they don't like. And Jesus is coming, and he's giving them this third option. Not push back like the Romans. Man, because there were, there were splinter groups of Jews trying to fight back against the Romans, and... Jesus is saying, nah, you don't need to do that. You match force with force like they want you to on, on their level. You resist evil. Like, and you have to go again back to the coin Greek. The word for resist evil is really just like fight, fight, like a battlefield. It's, it's the same word for like fight on a battlefield, which is what the Romans were good at. Man, they conquered much of the known world with their battlefield prowess. And so you're not going to beat them like that, is what Jesus is telling them. You're not going to beat them by playing their game on their rules. So a Roman soldier comes up to you and asserts his authority, asserts his dominance by slapping you with his left hand. Why his offhand? Because that's the hand that you wipe your butt with. That's the hand you do your dirty work with. That's the hand that you do all your non-respectful things with. You wouldn't, in Roman culture, slap somebody with your right hand because that means now we're equals. Now we're on the same level. And so we have this idea, this guy who thinks he's your superior. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. You're the slave. I get to do this. I'm going to show you my left hand. This is my butt-wiping hand. Blah. You don't even deserve this one. And Jesus is saying, look, you got smacked with the left hand on your right cheek, turn the other one also. And what are you saying? That's a very powerful nonverbal communication in that culture at that time to say, hey, face me as a man. Use your right hand. Face me as an equal. You want to hit me? Do it right. You missed a spot right here, bucko. And that forces a dialogue. That forces both parties to grow. So instead of forcing a physical fight, you create a situation where that person who thought they were your superior, who thought they could get away with this kind of nonsense, forces them to think critically about what they have done. Hey, if I want to continue down this path, I'm going to have to do it differently than I thought. I'm going to have to admit that I just treated my fellow man with disrespect and contempt. I have to admit that I'm a bad guy in this situation. And we see this all over the place. Go the extra mile. You've probably heard that one. And this one... It's, it's not a bad aphorism the way it's commonly used in Christianity. Go the extra mile. It's, it's generally thrown around like, you know, just do some extra work. Help people out a little bit more. But this is also a reference to ancient Roman oppression of Israel back in the days of Jesus. Because the Roman oppressors, the Roman soldiers had the right, the legal right, to force the Jews to carry their burdens, their packs their gear, for a mile, but no more. After a mile, that was it. They, they were no longer legally obligated to do it. And Jesus is saying, look, you think you have two options, either do it or don't. I'm giving you this third option. He bids you, he forces you to do this thing you don't want to do and carry it a mile. Go an extra mile. 
And now you put him in an awkward situation. Now he's going to have to... Now he's going to have to do some paperwork, explain to his commanding officer, ah, oh, man, I'm abusing my power. Or do a serious self-reflection. Hey, man, I'm, I'm abusing my power here. I'm abusing my authority. I'm going to have to look at this guy as an equal now because he's no longer doing this through compulsion. He's doing this for some other reason. I'm going to have to think about this. Now both parties have to grow from it. One perhaps grows through service and the other grows through grows through emotional jujitsu, man. What does jujitsu mean? It's often mistranslated to mean the gentle way. Same thing with judo. Uh, the gentle way, the gentle art, judo and jujitsu. Ju is Japanese. Usually translated as gentle. It's not gentle. Anybody who's ever done these arts understands there's nothing gentle about being tossed on the ground and slammed on the floor and strangled and twisted into a pretzel and having your arms broken. It's not gentle. It's physical combat. It's pretty rough. Actually, it's a fight. I mean, it's it's more gentle than being stabbed with a sword, kenjutsu, if you will, but... But it doesn't really mean gentle. A better translation is the yielding art, the yielding way. Ju, it's, it's I think, better to translate it, that as yielding in the context of judo and jujitsu. And that doesn't mean yield and lay down as a doormat and give up. It means instead of matching force with equal and opposite force, you have an intelligent reaction. When the guy comes at you, you use that force against him to throw him. When the guy pushes, you pull. When he pulls, you push. And we use these methods to overcome adversity with superior technique, and we give that other guy pause to think and to grow if we allow him to survive in that situation. And through the pursuit of jujitsu and judo, we become superior martial artists. And this really is the goal of any serious martial art. Really. So this is why I tell you Jesus is teaching you judo. Jesus is teaching you jujitsu here. Somebody's going to make a joke. Ha ha, jujitsu, J-E-W jitsu. Ha ha, because Jesus was Jewish. Okay, great. Write that in the comments down below if you haven't already. But this is all over the place, man. All over the place in, in recorded scripture. All throughout Matthew 5. He's challenging the norms and giving you third options. Think about that scripture where everybody was trying to catch Jesus in his words. The, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the Sanhedrin, the... the, the the religious leaders of the Jews at this time, they, they didn't like the noise that Jesus was stirring up, and so they were trying to catch him in his words, have that aha moment, like, aha, we gotcha, right? Because they had a lot of strict laws. And one of those laws was, you pay, excuse me, you pay tithes to the church, right? Under Jewish law, it's, you, you pay tithes 10% to the church. And... Also, under Roman rule, you pay taxes, and you pay taxes first to Caesar. So we have these two contradictory laws. The, relig the religious law, pay your tithes to God first, and the political law, pay your taxes to the government first. And so the scribes and the Pharisees come to Jesus, and they try to catch him, thinking there are only these two options. It's either A or B. So what do you say, Jesus? Do you pay the taxes to Caesar first, or do you pay the tithes to God first? And Jesus presents this third option, which gets us to think, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and render unto God the things which are God's. You're not going to catch me in my words. You're not going to force me into this stupid little battle of sophistry where it's A or it's B. You can't polarize Jesus, man. And that's, that's what he's trying to teach you. Be complete like that. Be a complete man like that. Don't polarize yourself and pigeonhole yourself into slot A or slot B. Present the third option of dialogue, which opens up the dialogue, which opens up your minds and your hearts to progress.
So what does that mean, turn the other cheek? Is turn the other cheek show mercy? Kind of, but in a roundabout way. Instead of beating the crap out of somebody who is disagreeing with us and, and trying to be condescending and trying to be insulting to us, this is not a self-defense situation Jesus is describing. A person in a position of authority, abusing that authority, trying to humiliate a subordinate person, is not a self-defense situation. That's an abuse of power. And Jesus is teaching you level that power dynamic by reminding that person, I'm a child of God and so are you. We're even, man. Think about it. Few places in this world, in this life, is there an equality like you will find in a cage fight? That sounds very strange. I have a, a Chinese friend and he gave a, an interview that I really loved and he's, he's a professional fighter. And they asked him, so, so why do you do this? And he told a story about how he grew up poor in a rural area of China, not a lot of money. He, he didn't go to a good school, couldn't afford it, didn't have nice things. But he said, when, when I'm in that cage, it's the one time in my life where I am equal with everybody else because they have to face me as a man. That's the gospel of Jesus in action right there, my friends. Treat other people like you want to be treated, man. Treat other people as men. Treat yourself as a man. Unless you're a woman, in which case, substitute those words. But, man, as a responsible adult human being with value and dignity. A cage fight is not an assault. A combat sport is not an assault. It's not a self-defense situation. We have two athletes and they begin that fight by shaking hands, by acknowledging each other, by looking at each other eye to eye as equals. And we are fighting not to decide who is the better man, but to decide who is the better fighter. And this is a very different thing. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.